This is your series of online classes. My name is Jonas and I'm your lecturer welcoming you all to Class Kirby. Season 2! <laughs> For this season, we're going to focus on pharmacology, its concept, and its application in the practice of nursing. For today's discussion, let me present to you the following objectives. Number one, I would like you to gain understanding with regards to the definitions of different terms related to pharmacology. Number two, I would like us to identify the importance and significance of pharmacology in the practice of nursing. And number three, we would be able to comprehend how these drugs or medications affects your body. But what exactly is pharmacology? When we talk about pharmacology, it can be subdivided into two major root words, pharmacon as well as logos. When we talk about pharmacon, we are referring to drugs. And logos, as you all know, is the study. Therefore, pharmacology is literally translated as the study of drugs. However, for this discussion, we would be focusing on the study of drugs and their interaction within the living system. This will encompass all the physical and chemical properties of drugs as well as their biochemical and physiologic effects to our body. This will include the knowledge of the history, sources, as well as uses of drugs where we will be tackling and expounding our knowledge in terms of drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, as well as excretion. Well, pharmacology is said to be an experimental science wherein for so long it has been known that this practice, this principle in science has been continuously developing. However, for this discussion alone, we will be focusing on the term drugs. Well, strictly speaking, a drug is defined to be any chemical that will affect a body or that will affect the living process. So every single material or chemical that will alter different biologic processes can be considered as a drug. However, for the discussion of our pharmacology class, we will be focusing on those medications or those substances or chemicals or drugs that has therapeutic effects to the body. We will be focusing on the term clinical pharmacology. When we talk about clinical pharmacology, it is basically the application of the uh, science of pharmacology among human beings. This will include the study of drugs, both to patients, which are basically the recipient of your medication, as well as to normal human beings such as you and I. When we talk about the therapeutic use of drugs, we uh, four words should come into mind. Number one is there are medications that are used to help us diagnose different physiologic conditions. A classic example of which is for imaging procedures. Sometimes your patients will be uh, ordered to take in medication that will enable several radiographic probably or scans to properly or uh, visualize your anatomical uh, landmarks or uh, basically your human anatomy in a better manner. Also, for example, you are having uh, coughs and colds or probably fever and you would like to treat the condition, you might probably resolve to a pharmacologic uh, intervention that will necessitate you to drink a particular medication. And that is the second purpose of the use of your drugs. It's basically for treatment and cure. Number three, there are medications that are not given to patients who are ill. However, the purpose of which is to prevent you from having illnesses. Classic examples of which are your immunization. Wala pang sakit, pero pinipigilan mo nang magkaroon ng sakit. Kaya, the third purpose of medication will be, or medication administration can be for the purpose of prevention of illnesses. And number four, typical for persons or for our elder clients. Uh, my father himself is taking medication to maintain and to keep uh, his blood sugar level at normal range. 
that is basically for the purpose of support and maintenance. So allow me to repeat the four major therapeutic uses of your medication. Number one is for us to help uh, in the process of diagnosis. Number two, for us to treat a particular disease or to have cure to a particular illness. Number three, to prevent illness from happening in the form of your immunization and vaccination. And number four, you have your support and maintenance. There are several routes by which we can administer these different drugs that we were talking about. However, for this uh, discussion, I will be tackling them on a superficial level. This will be furtherly explained on the next uh, videos and discussions that will be uploaded later this month. However, I would like to start, of course, uh, one of the most common route for medication administration will be through your oral region. Ito yung mga bagay na iniinom natin. For example, you have your tablets, capsules, as well as syrups, all of which are being uh, passed or ingested through your mouth and will go through your gastrointestinal system. We will talk about uh, this oral medication more as we progress through this discussion. You also have those medications insect, uh, in, uh, inserted or administered through your rectal region or your rectal medication. When we say parenteral, these are medications that are being injected. Uh, it can be given through intradermal, subcutaneous, you have your intramuscular as well as intravenous and so on. You also have your topical. When we say topical, these are medications or substances such as your lotion, moisturizers, antifungal creams, and ointments that you are putting on your skin or different parts of your body wherein you are basically applying them on a superficial level. You also have your enteric medication. Unlike your uh, oral medication, which is or which is being ingested through your mouth, your enteric medication is directly inserted through your enteric region or your stomach with the use of a gastric tube or probably other tubes such as your J-tube or your jejunostomy tube. You also have different medications that you are using uh, wherein you are doing puffs and inhaling these kinds of medication. I'm talking about your nasal inhalations as well as your nasal sprays. I still remember my grandfather during his time here in the Philippines. There was a time that he, well, put this large band-aid on his chest. And knowingly, this is another form of his medication in the, in the form of a transdermal patch. It was used, according to him, to somewhat regulate his heart rate. That is an example of your transdermal patch. You also have your sublingual medication. Unlike medications that are being ingested through your mouth, your sublingual medication are intended to be dissolved under your tongue. Ergo the term sub, below, lingual, tongue. They are not supposed to be swallowed because of several factors which will be presented later on in our discussion. You also have your medications depending on their site of insertion. You have your ophthalmic medication which are medications applied in your uh, uh, eyes or uh, in your optic area as well as your otic medications which are medications directly applied through your ears. In order for us to understand how different medications affects our body, we should first discuss these three factors that basically affects drug responses. You should remember the acronym D, T, and R, which means dosage, timing, and route. Dosage, meaning the amount of medication that we are providing our clients for them to ingest or somewhat flow through their body. Number two is timing, which refers to the time, the frequency, when are we to administer a particular medication. And lastly, you have your route. All of the following factors are important determinants on how drug will respond in our body. Unfortunately, guys, uh, this 
medications most often or more often than not are being administered with somewhat a little bit of compromise in terms of, well, timing, route, or dosage, which might lead or result to toxicity wherein the dosage might be too high or the treatment might be a failure where the dosage is not enough to cause any therapeutic reaction. In order for us to properly understand how these concepts jive with each other, we need to understand and discuss three terms. Term number one is pharmaceutic phase. Number two is pharmacokinetic phase, and number three is pharmacodynamic phase. Let's talk about first the pharmaceutic phase. As per definition, pharmaceutic phase describes how solid form of drugs disintegrate and becomes soluble and get absorbed through the bloodstream. Basically, this process involves two sub-processes, namely disintegration and dissolution. I would like you to understand that the pharmaceutic phase only applies on medication that are being ingested or orally taken. Why? Because in order for oral medications to pass that semi-permeable layer of your gut, for it to be absorbed, it should be somewhat converted to a soluble liquid form. Kasi your semi-permeable uh, semi layer acts as like a barrier that prohibits large substances to pass through them. In order for the medications to pass through them, we need to pulverize them. Sir, does that mean, in a strict sense, crushed paracetamol mixed in water is easily absorbed compared to paracetamol taken uh, as a whole? Well, in a strict sense, the answer is yes. However, different manufacturers has this concept or this substance called excipients. Excipients are fillers or inert substances that allow drugs to take a particular size or shape, which enhances the dissolution phase. Mind you guys, not all tablets, not all capsules, or let's start with tablets first. Not all tablets should be crushed. And not all capsules can be popped open. Because there is this concept you call enteric coated medication. When we say enteric coated medication, enteric means gut. Coated means they have a superficial protective layer. Meaning, these medications are intended to be dissolved not in your mouth, not in your esophagus, but in your gut, in your stomach, in your gastric region. Kaya binigyan ng protection. That's why guys, it will be a great error if you as the nurse will crush and destroy enteric coated medication. Because their coating is purposely uh, engineered in order to protect the medication from different substances uh, on its way going to your stomach. Mind you guys, a nursing responsibility never ever crush medications that are said to be enteric coated. I would like to read this to you. Most of the medications are absorbed through an acidic environment, usually with a pH of 1 and 2, which is basically the pH in your gastric area. On the other hand, there are medications that are intended to resist gastric acid. Ibig sabihin, pagpunta ng medication sa iyong uh, gastric region, they should not be dissolved because they have this property that they might be destroyed and rendered useless if exposed to a highly acidic environment. Gusto natin ma-absorb yung medication in a lesser acidic environment, probably in your small intestine. That's why pharmaceutical companies develop enteric coated medication. Now you understand what again is your nursing responsibility? You are not to crush any enteric coated medication because that will defeat the purpose of engineering a special protective coating. Let's go back to your pharmaceutic phase. Step number one will be disintegration. When we say disintegration, this basically means the manual breakdown of a tablet into a smaller piece. 
Ibig sabihin, from a tablet, from a solid paracetamol, we would like to have a powderized form. Uh, crushing or making tablets into a powder increases uh, surface area. When you have an increased surface area, that will be equivalent to a faster conversion or dissolution phase. Dissolution phase, in a strict sense, is the process of dissolving disintegrated matter or particles in the ga with gastrointestinal fluid in order to facilitate absorption, which will be part of the next phase. That's why it is important for us to understand how different medications are undergoing pharmaceutic phase. I have mentioned the concept of excipients a while ago. Probably these excipients are the one causing price variations between different medications. What am I talking about? There are several brands for a particular generic name which will be discussed later or on the next uh, uh, discussions, online discussions that we are to have. However, this is a general concept. If a medication has the same generic name, the active drug ingredient that you are looking for is the same from each other. What differs that causes price variations? It is the presence of your excipients. Why? Because these excipients might alter the pharmaceutic phase. Meaning, if a better, more suitable excipient is present, meaning the cost might be higher, the faster the dissolution phase. The faster the dissolution phase, the faster we are to get to the next process, which is your pharmacokinetic phase. But prior to that, I would like to specify the time in order for you to completely Turn a particular tablet into liquid form or the time that it takes for the disintegrated particle to be liquefied is what you call your rate limiting. Meaning, the shorter the rate limiting, the faster absorption can take place. Next, we proceed to the second process that we are to talk in this discussion, and that is your pharmacokinetic phase. When we say pharmacokinetic phase, this basically determines how much medication that is being administered gets to the site of its action. Sir, meaning not all medication that are being ingested by our patient goes to the site of action? Yes, we will further discuss it later on. However, let's divide pharmacokinetic phase into two words. Pharmacon, which means drugs, and kinetics or kinesis, which means movement. Thus, thus pharmacokinetic phase basically discusses how drug moves in your body, what the body does to the drug, all right? This particular phase can be further subdivided into four subphases. Number one is absorption, number two is distribution, number three is metabolism, and number four is excretion. Let's discuss them one by one. When we talk about absorption, this is basically the movement of drug from its site of administration into the bloodstream. For example, you were sick, you are experiencing fever, you have taken biogesic, ligtas kahit walang laman ang chano. Publicity aside, when you have ingested biogesic, Pag pumasok sa bibig, once it, it entered your mouth, it will go through your esophagus and to your gastrointestinal system. In order for it to take effect or to alter your uh, thermoregulatory uh, center of the body, if you remember your concept of anatomy and physiology, it should be uh, transported from your gastrointestinal system going to your bloodstream. And that particular process is what you call absorption. There are several factors which might affect absorption. Number one will be, as I've stated a while ago, the rate limiting time or in a strict sense, the rate of dissolution. Meaning, gaano ba kabilis natutunaw yung gamot? Because the faster you are able to liquefy a particular medication, the faster it will uh, undergo absorption phase. Is that clear? 
Yes, before a drug can be absorbed, it must be first dissolved. That is our concept. Number two is the concept of surface area. Probably you are having a difficulty in picturing what uh, surface area or how surface area affects absorption. Ganito na lang yung isipin nyo. For example, Sir Jonas uh, well, spilled uh, water on the floor. I have, I have two options. For me to use a piece of cloth or for me to use a big rug. Okay, the question is, which among these two options, the hanky and the mop, will have a faster uh, chance for me to dry up that mess or, or of my of that water spill? Basically, the answer will be the mop. Why? Because the mop is larger. That is correct. But the but, but the more uh, uh, technical answer is that the mop can absorb water faster because it has a higher surface area. What do you mean by that, sir? Here is the concept. The larger the surface area is, the faster the absorption. That's why, if you will check your PowerPoint presentation, there is a rug there with small like cilia protrusions. The purpose of those ciliated protrusions is to increase the surface area. Why? Because the concept is absorption or rate of, uh, rate of absorption is uh, faster or increases with an increase in surface area. Because those uh, cilia-like projections basically increases the surface area. Meaning, sir, we have understood that your gastrointestinal system is composed of different layers. In your gastric area, in order to allow stretching, you have your rugas or your folds. However, in your uh, intestinal system, particularly your small intestine, you have your microvilli. These microvilli are cilia-like projections that basically increases your surface area. Kaya nga, when you are asked which of the following anatomical site will absorb faster the, a particular medication, is it the gastric area or the intestinal area? The answer will be the intestinal area, primarily because it is full, uh, it is full of microvilli. Okay. Next is the concept of blood flow. When we talk about blood flow, imagine yourself. Uh, I myself, I'm uh, usually going to Baguio. And one of the landmarks in Baguio, Philippines, is the presence of SM there. A very common observation of mine is that people keep on piling up on the uh, uh, taxi booth. Why? Because less uh, or, or the number of People that are being transported is highly dependent on the number of taxi going to that particular stand, picking up those people. That's why without the presence of any taxi or any particular vehicle for you to ride, you will not be able to be transported in your destination. Same is true with the process of absorption. Imagine your red blood cell being your taxi and your medication being the people which are uh, uh, in line waiting for the taxi the lesser the blood flow the lesser the cab going to that taxi stand the lesser persons or the lesser medications you will be able to transport meaning when you are to put uh, a particular medication on areas with lesser blood flow tendency is absorption is slower compared to those areas that is highly vascularized. What is the concept? When there is increase in blood flow, there will be increase in the rate of absorption. All right. Next, lipid solubility and pH partitioning. I would like you to understand that your gastrointestinal system or the lining of your gastrointestinal system is basically composed of a phospholipid by layer. Ano yun? Taba, lipid. That's why if a particular medication is lipid-soluble, it will simply pass 
through that permeable layer, that semi-permeable layer easily because again, it can be uh, uh, because it is lipid soluble. Mas natutunaw sa taba. With the presence of fat on your layer, they will easily pass through. So the concept is highly lipid soluble drugs are absorbed more rapidly than drugs that are considered to be low lipid soluble. The last concept will be your pH partitioning. In order for us to understand this, picture yourself standing on an exclusive nightclub or any club. Well, everyone wearing jeans, black shirts, boots, jackets, and all ready to party and ready to have a bang. And you standing there wearing, well, professor-like shirt, these geeky eyeglasses, you will probably stand out. And based from movies that I have watched, all of those persons looking like that will not be allowed to enter that particular club. Why? Because they stand out. Sir, what is the relevance of that picture in the field of pharmacology? Simple. Medication that are standing out of their nature is uh, absorbed in a slower manner. What do you mean by that? An acidic medication exposed to an acidic environment is easily absorbed. However, an acidic medication exposed to a basic environment will be absorbed in a slower rate. Why? Because they are standing out. Because they are different. Their nature is different from their environment that they're exposed in. Meaning, they are the geeky ones. They are the odd ones. They are being held before being absorbed. Meaning, non-ionized medication are easily absorbed. What makes a medication non-ionized? When a particular medication in the, is exposed to an environment similar to its nature. Why? Basic, basic medication exposed to a basic environment, easily absorbed. Acidic medication exposed to an acidic environment, easily absorbed. However, if a particular medication is ionized, Meaning, it stands out because it's different. Meaning, an acidic medication exposed to a basic environment, slower ang absorption. Basic ang medication, acidic ang environment, slower ang absorption. So, the concept for your lipid solubility as well as pH partitioning is that lipid soluble medication as well as non-ionized meaning hindi nag-stand out na medication are absorbed faster than water soluble and ionized medication. Let me run again the different principles or the different factors that might affect your absorption. Number one is rate of dissolution. The concept there is the faster the dissolution, the faster the absorption. Surface area is number two. The larger the surface area, the faster the absorption. Blood flow is number three. The higher or the more vascular an area is, Increase in blood flow, meaning increase in absorption. Lipid solubility and pH partitioning. A lipid soluble medication is easily absorbed and non-ionized medication is easily absorbed. That is basically your absorption. There are several modes for you to absorb different medication. This is based from your concept of anatomy and physiology. When there is uh, no effort required in order for you to absorb a particular medication or there is no ex energy expenditure wherein medication simply moves through diffusion or through the process of diffusion from area of higher concentration to lower concentration, ang tawag natin doon, passive absorption. No energy at all. No effort. Effortless. Dahil lang maraming gamot dito, kaya pumupunta sila sa area na mas konti. That is through the process of diffusion, passive absorption. Sir, what if there are enzymes or proteins or carriers wherein they go against concentration gradient? They go against the law of nature which is diffusion. Nagkakaroon ng energy expenditure, meaning that is active transport, meaning there is effort given 
in order to transport a particular substance. And next will be pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is wherein cells of your body carries drug across members through the process of engulfment. Okay? In engulf nila yung particular medication in order for them to carry the to carry that particular substance all throughout your body. A while ago, I have asked this question. So, sir, are you telling me that, for example, paracetamol 500 milligrams upon taking in paracetamol 500 milligrams, not the entire 500 milligrams will be absorbed? The answer is, it depends upon the route. But if your medication is being ingested through the mouth, the answer is yes. That is the concept of bioavailability. Bioavailability is being described as the amount of drug dose that reaches the blood or the systemic circulation. Yes, sir, bakit not all of those or that 100% of your uh, paracetamol or that 500 milligrams of paracetamol will be absorbed in your circulation because it underwent pharmaceutic phase. And pharmaceutic phase, in a strict sense, might destroy portion of that particular drug. Kaya hindi 100%. That's why the concept is this. Medications taken orally, you cannot control their bioavailability. And most of the time, they are, le or all of the time, they are less than 100%. However, medications that are inserted directly in your veins or through your uh, IV, intravenous route, their bioavailability is 100%. Kaya mas alam natin how much dose of that particular medication is entering through your systemic circulation. So the concept is this. When two highly protein-bound drugs are given concurrently, they compete for protein-binding uh, sites, thus causing... Uh, the lesser affinity to protein drug be released and be active. Ano pong implication nun? There are medications that are structured to be highly protein bound. Why? Because of their high affinity to protein, mas mabagal silang nare-release sa mga tissue. Kasi dapat ganun ang rate of releasing of that particular medication. In the event that they will be released in a faster manner, what will be the effect it might cause toxicity? That's why you should be uh, mindful to these properties of medication. Uh, again, the concept is only free drugs or those drugs that are not bound to your albumin or to your body protein can cause a pharmacologic effect. Sir, paano naman? Kapag ka ang protein ng katawan, ang kulang or diseases that are said to be hypoalbuminemia or konti ang albumin sa katawan. The tendency is there will be no protein for them to bind. What will be the effect? They will simply be freely floating in your blood. And the concept, as stated a while ago, free drugs are active drug. They might cause therapeutic effect. And if drugs that are supposedly bound to a protein will uh, due to scarcity of protein or albumin in the body will not be able to attach themselves in that particular protein tendency is they might cause toxicity so always remember the concept of protein binding mind you Patients with liver or kidney disease or those that are considered to be malnourished may have an abnormally low serum albumin level. Anong implication? Mas magbilis mag-take effect ang gamot kasi walang pagbabind na protein site. Alright. Next will be the concept of your body tissue availability. Because the, the concept for medication in order for them to take its effect is that there should be a particular receptor waiting for that particular drug to meet each other. With the absence of that particular receptor, there will be no therapeutic response and distribution will be altered as well. 
So those are the three concepts that affects your distribution. Number one, blood flow. The higher the blood flow or the faster the blood flow is or the blood flow rate is, the faster the drugs is being distributed all throughout your system. Number two, when a particular medication is said to be highly protein bound and there is a, another highly protein bound medication, it will cause uh, the release of the lesser affinity or of the drug which has a lesser affinity to protein causing them to be free drugs and the concept is free drugs can cause therapeutic effect okay likewise if there will be lesser protein within the body tendency is more free drugs will be floating all throughout your blood works meaning the higher the chance for toxicity and lastly because of the concept of receptor sites the availability of different body tissues waiting for that particular medication is highly valued when we talk about distribution after distribution is the next concept we call metabolism. When we talk about metabolism, this is the process wherein the body starts to inactivate or biotransform drugs. As I said a while ago, during the process of distribution, these free drugs lingering all throughout your blood works will now find their receptor sites and will attach to them causing therapeutic effect. However, it's not all the time that these medications should keep on piling up through your body because that will cause toxicity. That's why the body needs to inactivate this substance and this will happen through the process of metabolism. Metabolism as described uh, is the process by which the body inactivates and biotransforms drugs. The basic uh, uh, organ responsible for metabolism is your liver because liver enzymes inactivate and converts your medication from lipid soluble to water soluble sir bakit you will understand later on however the concept that you need to understand at this moment is that if there will be a liver problem tendency is toxicity of different medication is highly to occur. Why? Because your capability to metabolize medication is slower. Likewise, if there are uh, uh, factors that might alter your metab uh, metabolism rate that might also alter the rate of your drug metabolism, which we will talk about later on. Liver diseases such as Liver cirrhosis, hepatitis might alter drug metabolism. Inhibiting, well, drug metabolizing enzymes or your CP450. Well, that is a basically technical term. However, all you need to understand, liver enzymes converts medication in order for them to be inactivated through the process of biotransformation or metabolism. When drug metabolism rate is decreased, Excess drugs will accumulate in your body and party party of this uh, of this particular drug will happen in your body tendency is it will uh, uh, it will result to drug toxicity. So in order for us to properly discuss this, allow me to define to you what first pass effect is. First pass effect is a significant decrease in drug bioavailability. Why? Because some drugs with high first pass effect, meaning mas mabilis silang na may metabolize ng liver compared to other medications. That's why not all medications are intended to be taken orally. Okay? Why? Because once they reach your gastrointestinal system, your liver will, will sense that particular medication. Uy! High first pass effect. Kunin ko na yan. Metabolize ko na yan. You will not have enough time for it to be absorbed in your... Uh, uh, circulation rendering your medication useless. Sir, paano po nangyayari yun? Ganito yan. If you remember your biliary tree wherein there will be a connection in your uh, intestinal, gastrointestinal system, basically uh, bringing nutrients and blood from your gastrointestinal system uh, through your lactals and all going through your uh, hepatobiliary tree. Okay? Uh, going through your hepatic triad, pupunta sa liver, and it will be metabolized. Some medication, 
Parang expressway sa kanila yon, Mabilis ang process na yun. Tawag natin doon, high first pass effect. And if the medication is branded to be having high first pass effect, meaning they are easily metabolized by your liver, they are not advisable to be taken in orally. Because this will determine or this causes significant decrease in the drug's bioavailability. And nga ulit yung bioavailability? It's the amount of drug that enters your blood works. There are several factors or therapeutic consequences of drug metabolism. Number one, if there is a faster metabolism of your drugs, therefore, acceleration in your renal drug excretion might take place. The most important consequence of drug metabolism is the next step after metabolism, and that is excretion. Kidneys are the major organs of your excretion, which will be explained later on when we reach excretion. However, kidneys cannot excrete materials that are not water-soluble. Kaya nga, anong sabi natin kanina? Metabolism inactivates or uh, facilitates biotransformation, wherein they convert... Uh, highly lipid soluble medication to water soluble through the process of biotransformation and what particular substance is responsible to that your cp450 uh, or what you call your liver enzyme liver enzyme again converts medication to water soluble may uh, substances in preparation for excretion that's why faster metabolism faster renal drug excretion Next is, as I, as I have stated a while ago, the purpose of your metabolism is for drugs to be inactivated. Drug metabolism can convert pharmacologically active compound into inactive form. However, there are medications that are termed to be pro-drugs. What do you mean by pro-drugs? Unlike your normal drugs, which upon metabolisms are being inactivated, ito baliktad. Ang pro-drugs mo, when they are being metabolized, their therapeutic effect increases. That's why they're termed to be pro-drugs. Next will be increase or uh, basically alteration in your drug toxicity. If there is faster metabolism tendency is, mas mabilis ang conversion from active to passive or active to inactive drug, meaning the high or the lower the chance for you to experience toxicity. That's why the principle that I have presented a while ago, if you have liver problems, meaning your major organ for uh, metabolism will be altered or will be affected, uh, slowing the rate of your uh, metabolism, the higher the chance that you will experience drug toxicity. Okay? That's why uh, the major effect or therapeutic consequence of your metabolism is basically the decrease in drug toxicity level. As I have stated a while ago, the major consequence of your metabolism is for us to prepare and inactivate medications in preparation for excretion. That's why the last step of your pharmacokinetic phase will be basically excretion. The major organ for your excretion, as stated a while ago, is your kidney. Kaya, Anong implication, sir? If there is a kidney problem, there might be problem in excretion. When there is problem in excretion, there is a high chance for toxicity because you will have no way of getting rid of those inactivated substances. So, based from our concept a while ago, when you have liver problems, you will have problem in terms of inactivating or biotransforming drug and that will lead to toxicity. Same is true with your excretion. If you have problems in, ki in your kidneys, therefore your excretion rate is being altered or you are not able to totally get rid of those uh, metabolites tendency is it will pile up in your body continually continuously growing in number party party ergo the result will be toxicity as well okay in in order for us to properly understand excretion you need to understand the concept of half-life sir ano po ba ang half-life or what you call t1 half your half-life is basically a time a time for a medication or the time it takes for half of that particular drug concentration to be eliminated. Let's have a better picture of how half-life is happening in your body. Focusing on the PowerPoint presented, 
Initially, when you take in a particular medication and it starts going in your body, it's said to be 100%. Well, theoretically speaking, 100% without considering the pharmaceutic phase. Pero, assume natin, 100% ang pumasok ng medication. After the first half-life, according to the definition, half-life is the time we're in, we are uh, chopping into two the current concentration of that particular medication, what will happen? After the first half-life, the medication that will remain is only 50%. Sir, that means after two half-lives, we will be completely eradicating or totally eradicating that particular medication? You are mistaken if that's your concept. Allow me to read to you again the time or the definition of half-life. The definition of half-life is the time it takes for half of the drug concentration, of the current drug concentration, not the drug itself, but the current drug concentration to be eliminated. Ibig sabihin, after first half-life, look at this paper, for example, this is 100% of your medication, after one half-life, it will eliminate half of it. Thus, the remaining portion will be 50%. Another half-life will not eliminate the 50%, but will eliminate the uh, half of the portion of the current drug concentration, meaning, ilan na matitira? 25%. Another half-life? 12.5%. And so on and so forth. What am I trying to say? What is the implication of which? Later, we will talk about your pharmacodynamic phase, which will basically determine the drug concentration within your body depending on uh, how you have taken in your drug. The concept is you need at least four to five half-lives in order for you to have a steady state of drug concentration. Kaya, ano ang implication ng half-life? This will be the basis when are you to administer another dosage. Because this might determine toxicity. Kasi ito yung oras para yung kalahati matanggal sa sistema mo. Hindi ka pwedeng maglagay ng gamot. Wala pang half-life. Nagbigay ka ulit ng the same medication that will continue to pile up the medication. Tendency is it will lead to toxicity. So this is basically the point wherein we are to do a little bit of math for your nursing subject. Let's try to solve Problem number one. As I read, drug A was administered to a client complaining of fever. According to the manufacturer, the drug has a T1 half or half-life of two hours. What will be the percentage of drug left after four hours? Let me give you time to think about this problem. Let's now solve the problem. Sabi sa problem, may medication that according to the manufacturer, half-life is 2 hours. Meaning, every 2 hours, it is being chopped into 2, wherein the other half will be eliminated. The question is, how much medication or what percentage of that particular medication will be left after 4 hours? Ibig sabihin... If this is the 100% of your medication, after 2 hours, ilan natira? 50%. And after another 2 hours, what will happen? It will eliminate the half or half portion of the current concentration, leaving you to the remaining concentration, which is 25%. Maliwanag? This is another problem. Problem number 2. Drug A... 500 milligrams was administered to a client complaining of fever. According to the manufacturer, it's the same drug as before as you can observe, half-life of that particular medication is 2 hours lang daw. How much medication? Hindi tinatanong ang percentage, but how much? How many milligrams of the particular medication will be left after 4 hours? And I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think this over. To solve problem number two, sabi niya, 
how much medication is left after four hours where the half-life is every two hours drug a after two hours 50 percent after another two hours how much will be left 25 percent similar to problem a however problem or uh, problem number two asks asks us how much medication is left that's why you know that only 25% of your medication remains within the body. And 25% of 500 milligrams is basically, you're correct, that's 125 milligrams of drug A is left in your circulation. Sir, I'm having a hard time in determining this, in picturing all of these half-lives. Can you help me more on how to solve how much medication is left after a particular number of hours? Definitely, yes. The mathematical approach for your half-life is basically a two-step mathematical process. In order to compute how much drug left, step one will be for you to determine ilang half-life ba ang nangyari. For example, a while ago, the question is how much medication will be left in 4 hours? What is your half-life? 2 hours daw. Ibig sabihin, how many 2 hours are there in 4? Simply divide the total time with your half-life. You will have the number of half-life. Which is, for that particular problem, 2. That is your step number 1. Step number 2 is for you to use this formula that I have devised. The amount of drug left will be equivalent to the total amount of drug divided by 2 raised to x. Sir, that's complicated. That's algebra already. Wait, just hold your horses. x simply means the number of half-lives. Yun yung sinolve nyo kanina na dinivide yung total number of hours divided by the half-life. Let's put it into application. Balik tayo sa problem number 1. Sabi ni problem number one, drug A was administered to a client complaining of fever. Now, according to the manufacturer, the half-life of that particular medication is only two hours. How much medication or, or what percentage of drug is left after four hours? Okay? Short time to digest again the problem. Then I will give you the mathematical approach. Sabi niya, kanina, we are to utilize our two-step mathematical approach. Step 1 will be for us to determine ilang half-life bang nangyari. And according to the problem, the total time was 4 hours and the half-life of medication of the medication is 2 hours. Simply divide 4 by 2. You will have or yield an answer equivalent to 2. That's why the number of half-life will be 2. Then, utilize step number 2. What will be the amount of drug left? For this particular problem, we're asking the percentage. Therefore, the total amount of drug that entered through the body is 100%. That's why, total amount of drug which is 100% divided by 2 raised to x. Again, what is x? The amount that you have uh, uh, arrived with in step number 1. That's why it's 2 raised to 2. Meaning, that's 2 times 2 equals 4. 100 divided by 4 is equivalent to 25. 25% of the medication remains within your body. Let's try again the same problem. Problem number two. For problem number two, the only difference is that we have an exact amount of how much the medication really is. And that is 500 milligrams of the medication. Same half-life, same total number of hours. Allow me to give you another or an ample time for you to digest again the same problem. Applying the mathematical approach for this problem, we are again to utilize our two-step mathematical solution. Number one, alamin mo muna ilang half-lives ba yung nangyari. Paano gagawin yun? Total number of hours divided by given half-life, which is equivalent to, again, 2. Now that we have the value of the number of half-lives, we are to determine how much drug is left. Unlike problem number 1, which asks percentage, ito, 
meron ng amount. At ang tinatanong, the amount. How much medication is left? That's why your answer should be an amount. How many milligrams? So, the total drug amount, which is equal to 500 milligrams, will be divided by 2 raised to x. x, which is the number of half-lives, meaning 2 raised to 2, equivalent to 4. 500 divided by 4 is basically 125 milligrams. If you are still confused on how to determine the number of half-lives, you can always approach me, particularly to my students, or you can leave some comments down below. And if we will have the luxury of time to answer all of your queries, then I will answer all of your queries as much as I can. Let me give you a summary of how your pharmacokinetic phase happens within your body. So again, there are four processes in your pharmacokinetic phase. Absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, as well as excretion. Uminom si Sir Jonas ng gamot, taken it, uh, have taken a medication through the oral route, wherein the medication will enter through my gastrointestinal system, from my stomach, small intestine, uh, wherein the process of absorption will happen wherein medication from the site of insertion will go to the bloodstream. Now that the medication is in our bloodstream, it will go through the different uh, anatomical uh, landmarks or anatomical processes of your body wherein they are necessary or where they are to perform their particular pharmacologic uh, effect. Upon distribution or upon utilizing the medication, the same med uh, medication will flow through your uh, liver wherein they will be converted into an inactive form through the process of your metabolism. And finally, will be excreted. Primary uh, mode of excretion is again through your kidneys. However, there are other modes of excretion such as through defecation, sweating, vomiting, and so on. That is basically your process of pharmacokinetic phase. Now that we know the pharmaceutic phase, the pharmacokinetic phase, we will now move on our last concept for this discussion, which is basically your pharmacodynamic phase. If your pharmacokinetic phase determines how medication is moving through your body, pharmacodynamic phase is the study of biochemical and physiologic effects of drugs and their molecular mechanisms by which those effects are being produced. What do you mean, sir? Pharmacodynamics can be divided into two, basically two words, pharmacon, which again means drugs, and dynamos, which means power. This determines the power of medication on how it affects your body. That's why this will answer, what does the drug do to the body? That is your pharmacodynamic phase. I would like you to understand that there are basically four major processes or four major ways on how a particular medication affects your body. Number one, it might replace or act as a substitute for a missing chemical or for a missing substance. Number two is that it will stimulate, hasten, catalyze a particular cellular activity in order for you to increase its, uh, well, activity. Next is there are some medication that might necessitate the body to well, take it a little bit slower or slow several cellular activities. And lastly, there are some medications that might interfere to the processes occurring to different foreign uh, cells or foreign substances, such as your antibiotics, which was discussed or thoroughly discussed in your microbiology classes. So those are basically your four major uh, responses or purposes of your medication on how it affects your body. I would like you to direct your attention to the screen or to the PowerPoint presentation. In order for us to further understand pharmacodynamic phase, we need to understand two terms. You have your minimum effective concentration, which is basically the serum, drug serum level, wherein, according to studies, this will be the minimum drug serum level that will produce a therapeutic effect. Meaning, any drug concentration below that minimum effective concentration will be ineffective. Walang therapeutic effect. And the second term is, kung may minimum, may maximum therapeutic or effective concentration. 
which is also equal to minimum toxic concentration. What do you mean by that? That is the highest possible drug serum level that you might uh, that you should achieve that will yield a therapeutic effect. Meaning, any drug concentration level that will shoot way past that minimum toxic concentration or that maximum therapeutic concentration, it will yield or will produce toxic effect. Okay? The distance between your minimum effective concentration and your maximum therapeutic or effective concentration is basically your therapeutic range because this is the range wherein the medication will produce therapeutic effects what is the uh, uh, bearing or the nursing consideration for this particular concept if the therapeutic range is narrow ibig sabihin there is only a very small area wherein the medication is considered to be therapeutic you should always monitor drug serum concentration because that particular medication can easily traverse from being effective to toxic. Classic example, digitoxin. Digitoxin has a very narrow therapeutic range. Meaning, anong gagawin mo bilang nurse? Palagi mong i-check ang drug serum concentration level because it easily becomes toxic depending on the client's body. As I have discussed in your pharmacokinetic phase, there are multiple factors that might affect the rate of your pharmacokinetic phase. Now you know three concepts, minimum effective, maximum effective, and therapeutic range. Next concept is your onset of action. Sir, what is the onset of action? Onset of action as described is the time it takes for a medication to achieve Minimum effective concentration. Sir, ano pong bearing? There is a specified time called onset of action needed for, for your medication to take place para magkaroon ng effect. Anong ibig sabihin? Example, you are in a particular uh, or you are attending to a client then the client took paracetamol. After probably a minute, he will ask you, nurse, nurse, can you take my uh, temperature for us to check if the paracetamol is taking effect? What will be your answer? Well, mind you, the onset of action of medications taken orally is generally longer than medications inserted parenterally or directly through your veins. Primarily because of the process of pharmaceutic phase. Meaning, mas matagal magtitake effect. Ibig sabihin, after one minute, do you expect that that particular paracetamol has already uh, uh, reached the minimum effective concentration? Hindi pa. That's why don't expect that you will experience therapeutic effect. Because what will be the most appropriate answer, ma'am or sir, that particular medication has this specified onset of action. We need to wait a particular amount of time in order for it to take effect. And the moment it takes uh, or it reaches the minimum effective concentration, that period is called onset of action. When the medication starts to be absorbed, your drug serum concentration starts to peak. And after arriving to your onset of action, you will have your initial therapeutic effect. However, the peaking of your uh, drug serum concentration still goes up. The highest point of your drug serum concentration is what you call your peak of action. Your peak of action basically is the time it takes for the drug to reach its, its highest drug serum concentration. What's the implication of which? In a strict sense, this will be the time wherein you will advise the patient to take a a, a blood test to determine drug serum concentration. Again, if your medication has a narrow therapeutic range, anong nursing responsibility? Mag-take ka palagi ng drug serum concentration. When are you to take your drug serum concentration or your blood serum concentration of that particular drug? When? At the time of the peak of action. Because again, this is the time wherein your drug serum concentration is at its highest. Lastly, 
the time or the total duration wherein the therapeutic or the medications drug serum concentration is within the therapeutic range ang tawag doon ay duration of action bakit duration of action common thinking kasi nga nandoon sa loob ng therapeutic range ibig sabihin may therapeutic effect ang particular gamot in this particular period that is basically the duration of action next will be the steady state mind you guys the steady state is a state wherein your drug serum concentration level is having a plateau. Why? For example, I have taken in a particular medication. It might not take effect immediately. However, there will be a time that the concentration will go down. In order to rescue that uh, down slope of drug serum concentration, you will take another dose. And another dose. And another dose. That's why I have specified a while ago that in order for you to achieve your steady state, you should usually experience five half-lives or at least have three to four doses of medication prior to somewhat achieving a steady plateau state wherein the medication is continuously uh, uh, causing therapeutic effect. This is the exact reason why several medications have a specified time. Kailan mo siya iinumin? Kailangan ba every morning and every evening, every morning, lunch and evening? Those times are being determined by your half-lives in order for you to determine the frequency and the amount of time needed in order for you to take again the medication in order for us to achieve a steady state. Sir, the, the effect of the medication should readily be uh, acquired or should readily be achieved. What can we do? We have this concept of uh, loading dose. Ano po yung loading dose? This is the time wherein you are to give a, 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 a higher dosage compared to normal in order to immediately pick your drug serum concentration kasi kailangan mo nang magkaroon ng therapeutic effect and that is basically your loading dose so those are your concept of your pharmacodynamic phase last is your uh, therapeutic index therapeutic index is basically a ratio between the effective and the toxic dose in 50% of the population you can uh, uh, see based from the uh, chart or the graph that is presented in this PowerPoint presentation the difference between a therapeutic effect as well as the uh, uh, toxic effect. TD represents toxic dose and ED represents effective or eff uh, therapeutic dose. You are to compare or to come up with the ratio on how uh, effective and therapeutic dose are being compared. What is the concept? The closer the value to 1, the higher the chance it might cause toxicity. Why? Because the closer the value to 1 is, ibig sabihin, mas kukonte ang difference ng toxic at effective dose to 50% of the population. Meaning, konting pagkakamali lang, it might traverse to being therapeutic to toxic. Kaya, therapeutic range versus therapeutic index. Therapeutic range is the distance or the drug serum concentration of the body that is considered to be therapeutic. The narrower the therapeutic range, the higher the chance for you to experience toxicity. Therapeutic index is the ratio between effective and therapeutic dose between 50% of the population. The narrower or the closer the value of your therapeutic index is to 1, the higher the chance you might experience toxicity. What is the nursing responsibility in order for us to monitor, control, and prevent toxicity? Always monitor your drug serum concentration. Another concept under your pharmacodynamic phase is the concept of your dose response. As per definition, dose response is the relationship between the minimal versus the maximal amount of drug dose needed to produce the desired drug response. Mind you, depending on the drug dose, different uh, changes in the drug response might happen. If you remember our discussion in your microbiology class, there are some medications that are, well, when administered in minimal amount, might be considered bacteriostatic, 
while when administered in larger amounts, might be considered bactericidal. So, nagkakaroon ng iba-ibang therapeutic effect, variations in degrees of affectation, depending on the dose. Another concept of which is the concept of your maximal efficiency. But before that, I would like you to understand that drug response or dose response is basically the physiologic response depending on the changes in terms of drug concentration. Maximal efficiency, as stated a while ago, is a point or a state wherein the, the uh, maximal potential of a particular medication is being achieved. What does that mean? Kahit dagdagan mo pa yung binibigay na gamot, hanggang doon na lang yun. Wala nang itataas pa, wala nang ilalaki pa or ihihigit pa, the effect might not be potentiated or might not be increased because that is the maximum or the cap level wherein that particular medication can take or can have or produce its effect. And a classic example of which is, the, uh, is your acetaminophen versus your morphine sulfate both of which are considered to be analgesic. However, morphine sulfate is given to patients experiencing chronic severe pain. Bakit hindi acetaminophen? Because these kinds of patients that are experiencing chronic or severe, fa- severe pain, an example of which or whom are those suffering from cancer, hindi natatala bang acetaminophen sa kanila. Primarily because the effect of acetaminophen is so is a little bit low for patients experiencing chronic severe pain to have or to experience its therapeutic effect. Meaning, for patients such as this na somewhat tolerant to the effect of these kinds of medication, despite them, uh, despite you bombarding them with the same medication since it's already at its peak or maximal efficiency level, wala nang magiging effect pa. Wala nang itataas pa yung effect. That's why you are administering magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate well is administered to patients who are experiencing chronic severe pain. I remember my grandfather back then uh, during his last days here on earth. Well, uh, he was already tolerant to uh, different analgesic and uh, it necessitated uh, the medical provider to administer a stronger form of analgesic in the form of morphine sulfate. Kasi hindi na kaya ng mga mas mababang level pa ng analgesic. That is basically your concept of maximal efficiency. It talks about your potency wherein the amount of drug needed to elicit physiologic response already reached its maximum level. There are several common drug responses or responses of the body uh, when we take several medications or chemicals within our system. Number one is the desired effect. Desired effect, as per definition, is the therapeutic goal of the medication. It is why you primarily administer that particular drug, what it is supposed to do. An example of which is, when you take an antipyretic, meaning gusto mong ibaba ang body temperature, the desired effect is lowering the body temperature in an event of a fever. Side effect, on the other hand, is also known as the secondary effect. This pertains to any effect caused by the drug other than the primary or the desired effect intended, uh, which can either be, well, beneficial or not. A common example of which is uh, the feeling of a burning sensation in the gastric region when you take an aspirin. It is an anticipated effect. However, Uh, It is not the reason why you are giving aspirin. The reason why you're giving aspirin is an anticoagulant. Ibig sabihin, it's a blood thinner in order to prevent coagulation, in order to prevent clot aggregation. Yun ang purpose ng aspirin mo. Pero another effect, secondary effect, is gastric irritation. Kaya nagkakaroon ng tinatawag na side effect. Side effect also known as secondary effect. However, there are side effect that is more severe in terms of symptom that causes problems related to medication administration. These are specifically termed as adverse reaction. Kanina, uminom ka ng aspirin. The side effect is well gastric irritation. However, because you are using aspirin in a prolonged chronic manner, it caused prolonged consistent gastric irritation leading to a gastric bleed that is considered already as an adverse effect. A gastric bleed uh, from an ulceration formed about by chronic use of your aspirin. 
Next is your idiosyncratic responses. Your idiosyncratic responses, unlike your uh, side effect or your secondary effect, these are not expected. Hindi alam. There are no studies that particularly points this particular manifestation upon taking that medication. This is termed to be idiosyncratic. An example of which is, for example, you are taking in a tranquilizer. The purpose of a tranquilizer is for you to, well, be put into sleep or for you to be put in a state of tranquility. However, upon uh, injecting or administering a tranquilizer, rather than the patient being sedated or somewhat groggy in nature, she turned or he turned to be a little bit agitated, restless. Yun ang idiosyncratic effect. Uh, well, a common example of which is this. Um, although there are other factors that might play the same uh, or that might cause the same effect. For example, I I drank coffee prior to my sleep in order to facilitate or in order to wake me up. However, upon drinking coffee, rather than me being more alert, it resulted to me being more sleepy. Those are what you call idiosyncratic. Hindi mo expect na magiging, side, uh, na magiging another effect of you taking in that particular substance. That is idiosyncratic responses. Another common reaction that we're expecting is your allergic reaction. When we talk about allergic reaction, we are basically explaining an antibody-antigen response within the body brought about by the administration of medication. Common manifestation of your allergic reaction to patients are, way, are uh, hives, rashes, pruritus, skin swelling, and the like. That's why it's important for us to somewhat test or determine if a patient is particularly uh, allergic to this active substance of that medication. Commonly done for antibiotics or rare medications, we are injecting or introducing small amount of medication to our patient to determine hypersensitive reaction. Why? An unresolved hypersensitive reaction might be debilitating and might be life-threatening to patient. This is termed to as anaphylactic shock. These are life-threatening, uh, unresolved, uh, allergic responses of clients that might usually cause cardiac arrest or respiratory collapse. That's why it's important for you to determine if a patient is uh, allergic or sensitive to these particular medications. And lastly, you have your toxic effect. When we talk about toxic effect, these are predictable adverse uh, drug effect wherein the drug serum concentration level, as explained a while ago, exceeds the minimum toxic concentration or your maximum effective concentration wherein it produces adverse reaction. Tumaas yung drug serum concentration, kaya nagkaroon or umabot sa toxic range. That is basically your toxic effect. There are variable factors that influences drug action uh, within our body. Uh, let's talk about them one by one. Number one is obviously age. Extremes of age makes one more sensitive to medication. Further explanation of this will be delivered on uh, your next handouts. However, uh, what you need to understand is that when your patient is too young or when your patient is too old, various adjustments with regards to their frequency and dosage as well as timing might be done because they are considered to be more sensitive to the effect of that particular medication. Next, body weight. Being exposed or being an OR nurse for almost three and a half years, a common question being asked by physicians, particularly anest uh, uh, anesthesiologists to us OR nurses, is what is the weight of your patient? Because weight is a very good determinant on how much medication are you to administer to your patient. Generally speaking, when the patient weighs higher, higher dosage is expected. Vis, uh, vice versa, when the patient uh, weighs a little bit on the uh, a thinner side or on the lighter side, 
it is expected that the dosage of the medication is a little bit lower. However, this concept is not always true all the time. That's why you still need to determine because there are still several factors that might affect drug response, such as number three, metabolic rate. Now you know that metabolism is the conversion of active to inactive drug, meaning if there are changes in terms of metabolism, might there be changes in drug effect? Yes. Patients that are considered to be hypermetabolic in state, hyperthyroidism, patients suffering from cancer, usually medications that are being administered to them are of high dose. Why? Because their body readily metabolizes medication, rendering, rendering the medication ineffective. Kaya nga, if you, ha, if you are to observe patients that are uh, suffering from cancer, after administering pain reliever, a high-grade pain reliever, a highly potent pain reliever, they will be relieved momentarily. However, with just a short period of time, they will suddenly complain of pain again because they are on a hypermetabolic state. Kaya, mas mataas ang dosage na binibigay ng gamot or mas frequent. On the other hand, when your patient is suffering from hypothyroidism, that will uh, somewhat result to uh, an, a hypometabolic state tendency is the medication will take a longer time for it to be metabolized. Therefore, you should monitor for a higher chance of toxicity. Another is the presence of illness. Illness such as blood pressure, diabetes that might alter blood flow. And we all know that blood flow plays a vital role in your pharmacokinetic phase, particularly absorption, distribution, as well as excretion. Sama na rin natin ang uh, metabolism mo. All of this might alter the effect of different medications within the body. Next, your psyche, your, psychologi your psychological uh, aspect. What does that mean? Patients with relatively high psyche, uh, Say, uh, psychological consequences have higher chance of compliance. Let me rephrase that. Patients with relatively high physical consequences have higher chance of compliance. What is that? There are two terms under your psyche. You have your nocebo as well as placebo. Let's start with placebo. Alam mo na to. This is where positive expectation to treatment and care received can possibly affect the outcome of your treatment. For example, you are uh, uh, tendering to a care of a patient experiencing post-operative post pain. You initially provided the medication that is supposed to be given to your patient. However, you know that that medication can only be given every 8 hours. After 4 hours, uh, post-administration of that particular analgesic, your client will now complain of pain. We'll call you, Nurse Jonas, I am already experiencing pain. Can you give me something in order to, uh, to alleviate this pain? You have noticed that somewhat, well, your vital signs are all normal without any uh, uh, objective manifestation of your pain, aside from the patient verbalizing pain. Then you ask the doctor and the doctor just told you, well, just inject uh, a saline solution. After administering saline solution, which basically does not have a pharmacological effect, the patient suddenly reported na, thank you nurse, my pain has been alleviated. Pain scale from 5 to 2. Thank you nurse. On the other hand, you know that saline does not have therapeutic effect. However, because the patient is expecting, has positive expectation that that particular treatment might affect him or her, it produced, well, a therapeutic effect. That's what you call placebo. On the other hand, nocebo is where negative expectation resulting to less optimal outcomes of the therapy. Kabalik taran lang ng placebo. Because you're expecting that you are to be worse, tendency is, yes, you will now be feeling worse. That's nocebo. Placebo and nocebo. Next is what you call tolerance. The concept of tolerance is this. This is the occurrence wherein the person begins to require higher dose. 
to produce the same effect, a lower dose initially or once provided already manifest. Let's put it in a in simpler explanation. In a relationship, when it's something fresh, something new, a simple, how are you? Have you already taken your lunch? Or, or just a simple hi will already bring that ecstatic feeling. However, because you are already in a relationship for two years, three years, or if you're similar to me, eight years probably, those kinds of words might not result to the same or will not give you the same effect as they were before. Because basically, you are now tolerant. Tagalogin ko para mas maganda. Dati, kinikilig ka dun sa pahilo, pahay niya lang, kumain ka na. Pero ngayon, dahil magkarelasyon na kayo, sanay na sanay ka na on his or her presence. It does not yield the same effect. Hindi ka na kinikilig sa pahay, hello, kumain ka na niya. Gusto mo may pa-chocolate na, may paregalo na. That's basically the concept of tolerance. Same is true with medication. Because you are consistently being exposed to these substances. Tendency is you will now be tolerant. Meaning you will require a higher dose to achieve the same therapeutic effect. Yun ang tolerance. Next is dependence. Dependence is wherein the person is unable to control his or her ingestion of this particular medication. Hindi niya na kayang mabuhay nang wala to. Okay? He, uh, he or his or her life is highly dependent on the presence of this medication to the point that this particular person is experiencing what you call withdrawal symptoms. Nagkakaroon siya ng symptoms, feeling, abnormal feeling when these particular substances are being taken away from them. I remember uh, uh, some of uh, my uh, relatives who happened to be a chronic smoker during the point that they have been experiencing difficulty in breathing and they were advised to withdraw or to stop from smoking, they experienced tachycardia, restlessness, and so on. These are signs of withdrawal. They are because they are basically dependent to the nicotine present in your uh, cigarettes. That is uh, drug dependence. However, there is what you call addiction. Addiction, on the other hand, is where you can control. Gusto mong mag-take in ng excessive amount. You are not just dependent. You are highly addicted. You can stop yourself from using this medication. That is what you call addiction. All of these factors might affect drug action within your body. The topic that we are dis to discuss in this uh, uh, first meeting will be your sub-branches of your pharmacology. Let's start with pharmacotherapeutics. Pharmacotherapeutics is the study of how drugs may be used in the treatment of disease. Uh, which among the drugs would be most effective or most appropriate for a specific disorder or what those would be required. This is basically what different pharmacological companies are trying to determine. They are trying to come up with studies that will prove the therapeutic effect of this medication. That particular branch of pharmacology is what you call pharmacotherapeutics, meaning anong effect ng drug in treating a particular disease. Pharmacy, on the other hand, is the study of techniques involved in number one, preparation, two, compounding, dispensing, preservation, and storage of drugs. All of these are the principles under pharmacy. Number three is pharmacogenetics. This is the study of genetically determined reactions of drugs in the human body. It studies the influences of heredity on the pharmacokinetics of drugs as well as the pharmacodynamic responses of different individuals to these substances. That is pharmacogenetics. Toxicology, on the other hand, is the study of the poisonous effects of drugs. These are the study of symptoms, mechanisms, treatment, and detection of different toxic uh, uh, effects of medication. Prior to a particular medication being released to public, it undergoes different toxicological uh, studies to determine its toxic effect to different individuals or specimens. 
And lastly, pharmacognosy is the study of physical and chemical properties of substances derived from different sources such as natural sources or synthetic sources that might be uh, uh, the foundation of development of multiple drugs in the future. Ito yung pinag in our microbiology class wherein they have started identifying one antibiotic after the other that is pharmacognosy. The study of physical as well as chemical properties of different substances that might lead them to producing pharmacotherapeutic effects. Now we're gonna talk about drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Pa kanina, ang sa pharmaceutic, pharmacokinetic, as well as pharmacodynamic, we are determining responses of the body and of the medication with each other, katawan at gamot. Ngayon, pag-usapan naman natin the common drug-to-drug -drug interaction, how each drugs uh, affect each other. There are several terms which we need to understand. Number one uh, is the concept of additive effect, wherein a medication administered together with another medication is equal to its sum, additive effect. Two drugs with similar action are taken together in order to double their effect. Synergistic effect, on the other hand, is more than addition. They potentiate, increases, they exponentiate, uh, uh, they, they multiply the effect. The combined effect of two drugs is basically great and greater than their sum. That's why they are usually administered together. Antagonistic effect, on the other hand, is wherein the effect of drug A is being contradicted by the effect of drug B. This is basically done, or medications are administered uh, together that are still considered to be antagonistic most of the time. If drug A has an undesirable side effect, in order to contradict that effect, they will are to administer another drug. That to balance out, to, to still keep that homeostasis. We are now in, uh, uh, using the concept of an antagonistic effect. Kono contra niyang effect. Next is displacement. Displacement, as I have explained during the concept of distribution, wherein a particular medication that is highly protein bound, uh, highly protein bound, is already existing within your system. Then suddenly you take in another highly protein bound medication, wherein they will compete for attachment sites for protein. One, uh, the other medication will be bumped off and will be displaced. That is the process of displacement. Wherein due to the displacement of that particular drug, it will now be considered as a free drug, therefore an active drug that might cause therapeutic effect. Or if uh, more than uh, uh, medications are being released in a faster, abnormally fast manner from their protein binding site, that might result to toxicity or a sudden increase in your serum concentration. Interference, on the other hand, is wherein the first drug inhibits the metabolism of the second drug. Uh, if you remember in the concept of our uh, mm, microbiology, wherein a medication in order to prevent different metabolical substances to act on them, to inactivate them, we are, we are administering an additional medication to somewhat protect them from being metabolized. Kasi pag na-metabolize ng gamot, it is rendered to be ineffective. Wala nang kwenta. Kaya kailangan natin protektahan ng gamot. Ano ang gagamitin natin? Mag-administer ko pa ng isang gamot together with that particular medication. That drug-to-drug -drug interaction is what you call interference. And lastly, incompatibility. What does incompatibility mean? The presence of one drug basically deteriorates the potency of the other drug. That's why these medications are not being administered together at the same time. Now, let's wrap up our discussion. We have started by defining what pharmacology is, wherein we have stated that pharmacology is the study of drugs. Drugs pertains to any chemicals that produces or alters the living processes of the body. However, for this discussion, as stated, drugs will pertain to substances with therapeutic effect or therapeutic consequences in our body. 
there are four major reasons why we are administering medications in the body. Number one is for the process of diagnosis. Two is for treatment or cure. Three is preventive medications. And number four is supportive and maintenance. We have also somewhat uh, tackled the different routes of medication administration, namely oral, rectal, infusions such as intravenous, uh, uh, intradermal, intramuscular, subcutaneous. You also have your uh, topical enteric medications, nasal inhalations, sprays. You also have uh, 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 transdermal patches, sublingual medications, ophthalmic medications, and otic medications. Then we have further uh, explained that there are basically three major factors that affects the effect that affects the effects of medication on how medication affects our body. Okay, that is your DTR, your dosage, the amount of medication, timing, the frequency, when are you to administer medication, and the route, which was previously explained uh, uh, on the earlier part of our discussion. You also have your pharmaceutic phase, where it basically involves two processes. Disintegration, which is the process of uh, manually breaking down the, the, the solid substance or the tablet for that matter. And dissolution phase, which is the process wherein you are liquefying uh, disintegrated ma materials. The time it takes for disintegrated materials to completely be liquefied is what you call rate limiting. We also have discussed pharmacokinetic movement of drugs within the body. There are four phases of your pharmacokinetic phase, absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, as well as your uh, excretion. The primary organ for your metabolism is your, kid, uh, is your liver, and your primary organ for your excretion is your kidney. Ergo, changes, problems, or diseases in these uh, uh, organs might lead to toxicity. We have also discussed pharmacodynamics wherein we have specified three terms, onset, uh, peak, as well as duration of action. We have also differentiated and determined minimum effective concentration, maximum effective concentration, and the distance between them is what you call therapeutic range. Now, if the therapeutic range is narrow, your nursing responsibility is to always uh, or to regularly check the drug serum concentration to prevent or to er for early detection of drug toxicity. We have also discussed drug dosages, dosage responses, as well as your half-lives and, uh, well, bioavailability, as well as your first pass effect. Factors that affect drug responses are said to be the following. Age, weight, metabolism, illness, or comorbidities. You also have psychological aspect which involves placebo, positive, and nocebo, negative. You also have tolerance versus dependence versus addiction as well as cumulative effect. By the way, cumulative effect is the additive combined effect of all your medications taken. Drug responses can be classified into five. Unang response will be your desired response called your primary effect. Another effect which is not considered to be your primary effect is your uh, secondary response or your side effect. Uh, a, uh, a worse version of your side effect that causes uh, damage to the body is what you call your adverse effect. Effects that are not well anticipated upon administering that particular medication is termed to be idiosyncratic. Hindi natin alam, basta na lang lumabas. An antibody, antigen response will now result to hypersensitive reaction, number four. However, prolonged hypersensitive reaction that remains unresolved might lead to life-threatening condition called anaphylactic shock, which might result to anaphylactic shock, which is life-threatening and might result to cardiac arrest or respiratory collapse. And number four, when I, and number five, when the drug serum concentration uh, uh, shoots way beyond the minimum uh, toxic do, uh, concentration or the maximum effective concentration, it might produce toxic effect. 
And lastly, we have discussed different drug-to-drug -drug interaction which are additive. The sum is the same. Synergistic, the effect of two drugs combined together is more than the sum. Antagonistic, the presence of one drug cancels the effect of the other. Displacement, two pro highly protein-bound medication will compete to protein binding sites which will bump off the other producing free drugs which again are considered to be active interference on the other hand is the presence of drug b will prevent the metabolism of drug a incompatibility this will require you not to administer both this medication at the same time for it will nullify each other's effect so that is basically your first online class season two of our class kirby introduction to your pharmacology Again, this is Jonas saying that learning should always be a fun experience. Goodbye, everyone. Always keep safe. God bless.